you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, welcome to the show. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. When the Iron Lady sings, that makes it official, ladies and gentlemen, live on the Chris Voss Show. As always, we certainly appreciate our family being here. We bring you the smartest people in the world on the Chris Voss Show for 15 years, and we just did the numbers in the last four years. We've increased the uh, downloads on the show 1,405%, just the last four years, not, not even counting the whole 15 years, but we changed the format four years ago. So uh, thank you for sharing the show, listening, and uh, being in the engaging audience that you are. As always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, fortress Chris Voss, linkedin.com, fortress Chris Voss, youtube.com, fortress Chris Voss, Chris Voss, one on the TikTokity, the only other place we are in the interweb. Amazing young lady on the show. We're going to be talking to her about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, data analytics, uh, products solutions digital evolution and all things that are happening in the world of tech today henna karna is joining us on the show she is a passionate tech entrepreneur and artist at heart with over 25 years of experience in leading product innovation across digital data and analytics as a mission-driven individual she focused on building industry agnostic Capabilities that leverage data, technology, AI, ML, and analytics to create risk, resiliency, and accelerate humanity's advancement or AI's advancement to AI's detriment or humanity's detriment. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how it all works out. Welcome to the show, Hannah. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. Nice to have you. Great intro. <laughs> Lots there you of go. There. <laughs> we need to accelerate humanity's advancement because we got we some did. competition, I think, from AI. <laughs> So give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs to learn more about you? Uh, I just you know, slowly started a, a website trying to bring together some of the things that have happened in the last you know, couple decades. And that would be hennacarna.com. So it's just my name. And then, of course, LinkedIn is another place to go. And there's there's a, on LinkedIn, you can probably find me through a couple of groups that I'm part of. So there's a, there's a women's entrepreneur group. There's a creative destruction lab group and a few other boards that I'm on as well. So for sure, there's two ways to get there, get to me. There you go. So give us a 30,000 overview of what you do and how you do it in your words. Yeah, I, that's a great question. So let's start with the digital, the world of digital. That we're, yeah. I, I'm not a native to digital. I, I'm close to 50 almost, so definitely not one that grew up with the phone next to me. Still remember the little phone. <laughs> you and I, yeah. I remember dying on the phone. and the. Yeah. yeah, when people called, you picked up and you said, hello, who is this? But now you know all this in advance. So from I think the world of where we had IBM, you know, punch cards all the way to where we are now, there's organizations that are trying to shift to get to be very digitally heavy. And that meant in some cases being very tech savvy, being AI savvy, using data differently. So I, I love that space. I love the space of where we are bringing organizations or capabilities into the world of digital. And at the same time, pulling together the right skill sets, the right human beings, the right individuals to make that happen in a scalable way. So I, I kind of marry People, technology, and I, I don't want to say process, but I, I but what to do with that? You know, what do we create mm -hmm. in terms of value with that? That's what I do on a day to day basis. There you go. And you you do speaking and keynotes where you uh, share your expertise with people. Yeah, more and more. You know, more and more. I've been being I'm reached out for board discussions. Sometimes at the board level, I'm on a couple of public boards, and oftentimes there's a lot of dialogue about what to do with AI. How do we get educated on AI? What's the right process to take? You know, how many consultants do you bring in? What kind of people do you bring in? All of that stuff. And then for sure, there's a lot of keynote speech on the, the space of risk. Risk and insurance was a, a, the, the last 15 years of mine. And then uh, there's, a, there's a whole discussion around diversity. And not, not, a, not a gender or physical diversity. I mean, much more technical diversity. How do we think about a lot of things differently? Same, same problem, but solving in different ways. So diversity of thought process. There's a lot of discussions on that as well. Diversity of the thought process. Uh, yeah, we're going to need more of that. In fact, we, 
we may need we may need uh, we may need diversity hiring support for so the AI will keep hiring humans at companies. <laughs> Very possible. There you, you know, go. We're gonna get more and more creative the more mm-hmm. AI heavy we become. So that's yeah, in fact. On that topic of jobs, I, I hear that more more and more job recruiters are going to be using AI, where basically AI is probably going to look at your resume first and take the yeah. human choice out of it, which is going to suck for me because usually I bribe whoever it is that uh, I need to hire me for a job. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> no, no. You know, it's not, it's not that far right now, actually, Chris. So there's like these systems, right? Most companies mm-hmm. use these systems to like look for the keywords or whatever. Yeah. So now you'll have maybe something more intelligent than just a a keyword search that actually can look at the context of what you're saying. Yep. This is why I've worked for myself for 18, since I was 18, is because I'm unhirable. You also talk about executive leadership as well. Any touch on you want to talk about that? Yeah, this is more out of experience and a lot of time being spent with HR departments in every organization that I've been part of, partly because Mm. we tend to look at the gap of skill sets and executives as something that is not easy to is not easy to close so we hire more you know when mm-hmm. something is different and new coming you know gen ai is a great example we're going to look to hire people with gen ai background that's an immediate reaction and when mm-hmm. we think about executive coaching it could be the opposite it could be that we have to now figure out the internal model of of you know of internal uh, an internal training internal upskilling letting the individual be in the driver's seat as to where they, where they want to go in that space. We don't do too much on that in industries. And I think that's a bit, a bit of a myth. You know, the technology can help us learn as much as we can hire the next person to learn as well. So we, need, we may need both. I think we need both. So you're finding a lot of boards, a lot of companies are, are kind of trying to figure out how to gear this approach to AI. There's so much of it, and the scale and, and speed of it is just relentless. Like I, I remember adapting to social media when it first came out and it, it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal, at least not for me. I, I understood it. The social media. I mean, duh. <laughs> but for some reason, some people needed books and everything else for it. But this is accelerating in a fast. I think, what did it do? Just barely hit a one-year mark for generative yeah, AI with it, OpenAI? It, it, it's gone past Netflix and a couple other yeah. big, you know, big evolutions in our, in our day and age feels like three years to me and I'm still trying to figure it all out. And there's so many different, you know, every day, just new stuff hitting and it's moving so fast. So you help the companies and give them advice on how to navigate this. You go out and speak on it. What do you, what do you see the, the biggest challenges companies are having right now with trying to figure AI out or adapt to it? Yeah, I, there's definitely a fear component, Chris. You know, I, I, I'm not a historian, but oftentimes we look at history and we see anything that a dramatic change it's 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 kind of uh, it's met with quite a bit of resistance or or, or <laughs> distrust perhaps or maybe even more than that the so, lights sort of yeah. concept right revolutions where people die not evolution yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah i think there's a bit of fear but the the way to mitigate that is to recognize there's a there's i think of ai is three major sort of you know stages of, of where we're going to be headed we're going to end up using the ecosystem more so when we use it, so if I'm like a, I don't know, a finance executive, I'm going to be able to lean on different parts of the components of the finance ecosystem more actively because AI is going to give me that speed, that, that sort of holistic nature of things before manually I have to do it all together. So manually, we run out of time all the time. But if you use AI for that sort of evolution, I can gain perspective from so many different parts, bring it together really quickly. I might actually have a much more holistic lens than I did before. So it's going to play the ecosystem much better. Yeah. That's one major area. I think creativity is going to be a big area for That's the second one. Yes, generative AI. It's helped me be more creative. You know, you got people writing whole books with generative AI and publishing them now, and Amazon kind of starting to have a problem with it because they're just flooding the system. And sometimes they're they're just recopying books that were already made. But generative AI helps with that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, for me, like I can put something in that I have a thought process on. It can help me flush out the thought process for a book or something I'm writing on an article. It can help flush it out and kind of expand my original concept of ideas. And then I, you know, I move everything into my words. But, you know, it's kind of like if I get stuck, like if I get, you know, you get stuck on a concept or idea. One thing that was kind of interesting you may have thought about, we, we have a lot of people that come on and talk about AI in the show. For some reason, it's popular. I don't 
the it's like it's almost like it's a thing now but uh, one thing that someone brought up that i didn't get to flush out on the on the earlier show was that even like lack luck lackluster or your bottom level employees they can kind of use ai to cheat where they can make it look like they're creative and they're they're coming up with lots of ideas and doing stuff and i'm like wasn't well, that kind of bad because you know maybe they'll get ahead of the really truly creative and talented employees that you have you won't be able to figure out who to fire anymore <laughs> yeah there, there certainly could be a a masking of things right at yeah. the onset but that just gives us the ammunition to think about how do we how do we look for success what's the measurement of yeah. like, what's the kpi look like like what's mm -hmm. a really good outcome or output mm -hmm. to, in today's age maybe pre-ai it was different and post-ai now it's going to have to be a little bit more you know, fine-tuned as well. So we should use AI to figure out the KPIs of the AI that use the capabilities that built the other stuff initially. I think, do you think we need to be able to identify AI better so that we can separate who the true creatives are? Like recently there was a, a young lady who published a book that won a book award of some type. Somebody have to Google it. But basically 80% of the book was written by generative AI and 20% was by her own creative hand, by her own admittance. And she, she was using it to be creative, but it was pretty much, she was pretty much letting her write 80% of the book. And she won a major book award, right, probably against other competitors that were creatives that, you know, wrote their own work. And I know what that feels like writing a book. So, what are some of your thoughts on that? And do we need to have like an asterisk, kind of like, you know, the Hall of Fame baseball where, you know, during the steroid era, they had to be like, well, these guys really kind of cheated a little bit. I, I think that's a really good point. We know when we do research, we do references, right? We always mm -hmm. have like a, there's a, there's a way to validate or verify what we're saying. It's not just Hannah said so, or, or Chris said so. Chris, you might have the right to do that. But, you know, the, uh, the reality is we want to, we want to know that it was anchored on some other things. It had a precedence. So mm -hmm. AI is something like that. When AI brings it together, it is a, a slew of other voices that it's collating. Mm -hmm. The reality is we should be able to give credit where it's due, you know, where the yeah. roots were of that idea. And maybe we can't create the root all the way down, but now we can say we use Gen AI from these different sort of plethora of inputs that collate is something like this. I think that's very important because AI itself is not its own being. It's a multitude of people that are contributing to that. Yes, it's it's mm -hmm brought it all together but that that book is not standing on its own right it's standing on yeah. on so many other inputs so yeah a, a reference or a um you know a footnote or, or or even like some many footnotes that go across the the the, the areas in which she used it i think that would be pretty powerful yeah. and it would just credit to her too it would be good for her to see that as well yeah and it and it would be good for you know like in competition to be able to say hey you know if you're gonna if you're gonna win New York best time seller book of the year or whatever the hell, you know, there needs it better, to it better be yours. <laughs> the the playing field needs to be leveled, I think. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm I kind of feel when I say this like I'm some old guy, I don't know, you know, I'm Clint Eastwood on the lawn spraying the kids. Going, no, it happened with art. Oh. It happened with digital art, right? Yeah. When, yeah. when 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 we first started looking at I mean comic books, for example, I just met recently a a, a woman that has does does the comic books by hand still she's still gradients like wow. everything is done it's beautiful but mm -hmm. yes it's a lost art I, I don't know you know the value of that particularly from an economic standpoint but it's mm -hmm. incredible work and if i look at her work and what we print today i, I couldn't tell the difference yeah but you know there's got to be value in the fact that she hand does all this right there's something something to be said there yeah and i i uh, the hope is from what we've talked with ai people is that our ability to create as humans and use AI to create will make it so that we're not replaceable by AI uh, as much. And, and I'm sure that there's certain jobs and different things that are going to be replaced by AI, but maybe it will usher in a new value where we, where we find our ability to use it as, you know, a way, like, like I said, I use it to expand my creativity more. Sometimes it comes up with better questions for guests on the show. Than I would come up with. That's uh, all good stuff. Yeah, we'll use it I as a cheat. I change my car, update my 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 Mustang. <laughs> it it knows yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah, I you know one of my dogs is going through cancer right now, and one of my friends, I was talking with one of my friends who has had several dogs go through this experience, and so I was getting counseling from him because he's been through that, and 
unbeknownst to me, he started jamming all the data from the can the the you know the analysis that we're doing, the tests we're doing into Chat GPT, and he started having a conversation with him to give us feedback on the best ways to treat my dog, and I that never crossed my mind. I'm like, you're doing what with the dog's data? You're talking to Chat GPT. I mean, we're wherever you're talking to doctors. What are you doing? And but it was interesting some of the things that it came up with, results and stuff. And I, I mean, I just never would have thought of that application at all. But that, yeah. that can that can be a little little scary, Chris. So if I Google. <laughs> you know, one of the things I learned there was we Google is overly conscious of the fact that it can be potentially you know, someone could say to chat GPT or, or some, some system, you know, my, my son or daughter has 102 fever. What do I do? What's the, yeah. what's the right number of, of Tylenol to give and, or Mortrim, which one do I give? And those kinds of questions become very difficult because if they require several other pieces that of course that system may not know yeah. to ask. Yeah. So the other, I recommend give them five yeah. pounds of cocaine. It'll be fine. Or, if, like, or it may, it may, I mean, now we have it. I think Google's in, in sort of the response has often been, that's a question that we should go to a, professional for our, we know that's what we don't do. So it does sort of disclaimer that, mm -hmm. and maybe we have to know as human beings when to lean into into some directional information with, with AI, as opposed to a decisioning mm -hmm. uh, you know, a criteria with AI. AI, I think is more directionally used right now. One, one thing I would maybe suggest to think about with, with our listeners is that when we're an organization, there's a lot of discussion around you know, loss of job, right? Some, cause you were mentioning also what jobs will stay and what jobs will go. and um, in my, in my most recent, the last couple of companies I've, I've helped sort of go digital with, we talk about these four kinds of jobs, right? There's one, mm -hmm. one of those is like these rote activities. They do the same thing every day. It's not nine to five, but it's one of those things where it's a, it's a very process heavy. It, it is manually intensive process heavy kind of job. So we call them manual jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is like a, a build up. Manual jobs can become more like a builder. So they can take all those pieces and they can start to build things, build products, build solutions, build something. They're physically or, or you know, intellectually creating information or building something, like an asset of the company. And the third pillar that we look at is people who are um, consuming those things. So they're like the analytically savvy people. They're taking the building, they're building information out of it. They're, they're getting like, I don't know, a customer point of view out of it, or they're figuring out the next customer company strategy. They're doing stuff out of that. The, so they're mm -hmm. analytically savvy. And then the fourth are the ones that are at the highest level executives that are making it go. You know, I, I know all this stuff now. Now I'm going to, you know, move in this direction of this region or this company or this area. And they're actioning all that stuff. And today, on average, and I'm, I'm generalizing, this is a very linear approach, Chris. Like, it may not be the same everywhere. But mm -hmm. on average, most companies' jobs are in the first two, if not the first one. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a hyper, like broadly speaking, in all the industries, you know, holistically, it's the first two, they're manually and they're analytical. And then when we have AI applications, what we would love to see is organizations have more analytical people and more heavy on the, I know what to do now. Like, I've got all this stuff ready. I know what to do now. I can be more actionally you know, oriented. I think that movement's going to be amazing. The less, less manual, more builders, more analytical, more sort of, you know, ready to execute on, on vision. That's what we want to do anyway. I think that's what the fun is, anyways, for the most part, for most people. There you go. Maybe we can maybe we can have an AI that goes into uh, unnecessary uh, team meetings, and it, you start putting in the conversation, and then it monitors the conversation. It's like, hey, we can cut this short now. Here's the answer, and just everyone go do it. Just like this one, they should summarize my answer right away. <laughs> <laughs> but then it wouldn't be such a fun conversation, and <laughs> and the human aspect of going back and forth. So yeah, it was just announced. Uh, this is on LinkedIn News again from an hour ago, but I believe this was announced yesterday. OpenAI and Furl's AI-generated video. So they've kind of joined that crowd now. I know there's a few other vendors that do that. What are your thoughts on, like, OpenAI specifically? Are these guys really the true leaders, that you, you know, the future Googlers? I know that there's something we talked about in the green room also a day or two ago. They announced that they were going after Google, Google Search, basically, which is, uh, man, take a shot at the king, if you will. <laughs> I, I think there's so much room mm -hmm. for so many great things to do and so many companies have a lot to contribute and there's the, the playing field is extremely broad right now there, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of room to 
to invent and innovate and, 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 you know, pay it forward. So for sure, there's a lot to be done. And there's, I think we need all, all the high tech companies out there to, to start thinking about what, you know, they are already thinking about, you know, how do we make it more useful, more consumption ready, easier for everyone to sort of, you know, lean into it. Of course, you know, ethically all viable. And that's a, that's a big thing. It's going to become a big regulatory discussion yeah. and, 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 and strategically, but security wise, right? So, you know, how does security play into all of this? There's a lot to be done in this space, to be honest. Yeah, you you bring up a lot of great topics. The security aspect of it, it you know, it's it's really crazy. We had someone on the show who wrote a book about this, and they basically took Darwin's was the Origin of the Species, I think it is. Oh yeah. And they, Survival they of the fittest, or? what's that? Survival of the fittest, something like that. Yeah, basically. And so what they did is they took Origin of the Species and they aligned it with what we're doing with AI, and their identification was that. AI is going to become eventually its own species and and basically a species that may or may not compete with us. I suppose it's, it's up to it, whatever it wants to do. And so, you know, some of his concerns he brings up is, of course, tying AI to weapon systems where it can make decisions that are normally are held by human beings right now. So, you know, to launch a nuclear weapon, et cetera, et cetera. And he talked about, so you know, a lot of different paradigms. Of it. What, what are your thoughts on that? concept or theory of of ai being its own species eventually or now it's a, it's a hypothetical I, I i would say you know what what do we define as species in our mm. in our mind on a typical basis we think it's an organism yeah we're we're bacteria organisms <laughs> yeah. electromagnetic but we're also you know organisms that are biologically evolving uh, and in that model i you know ai is not an organism that's biologically evolving so I, so yeah. but that said i i mean right now one of the third we were talking about the, the uses of ai so yes mm -hmm. ecosystem creativity a third one is going to be sensory just mm -hmm. what what do i wear and how it affects my 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 body what, how i do when i when i'm running track versus something else mm -hmm. all that's going to shift and i mean it, it's not mutating into our dna but it's certainly something like that so mm -hmm. i don't know if it's its own species but it's going to help our our species yeah. i think i think he doesn't define it though by biology and it, but, yeah. but by by being its own species in the sort of same vein where it's its own you know it like evolves humans, on its own. yeah it evolves on its own his 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 thing was is is it it, it we're, we're we, us as humans we're limited by we're i think we're limited in our view of life be, because we our number one paradigm is to breed and survival of the species propagate the species you know that's what our universal paradigm and most biological species or driven mammals by. whatever you want to call it they're driven by that you know everybody's here breeding the snakes the lions the tigers the bears you know and that's kind of you know what we do, you know, as, as a man, everything we do, everything we do to buy, we do it to impress a woman, make her happy, propagate the species, create a family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, um, the, the, the issue, the thing that he brought up with AI being its own species that will evolve and, and, and develop itself eventually, I don't know if it's quite at that point yet, but it, eventually, you know, the, the concept is that it will turn that curve. It will, it won't be limited by any of that. You know, it's just not, it's not trying to get laid in the backseat of a car on prom night. It's going to be thinking about things that we may never have even really considered as human beings, which is kind of extraordinary when you think about our run. But, you know, it, it, it will probably be thinking about stuff and, you know, and it may look at us and just go, you guys are really annoying and you smell bad. Well, know. and and we, what do we, you know, we are based on fear. We're based on food. Exactly. Is, right. Exactly. That's the other thing that we, our life, our day in a life sort yeah. of revolves around. Yeah. And AI wouldn't have, may not have any of that. It doesn't need food for sure. So, yeah. Um, and you, you, you nailed it right on the head there. We had a gentleman on the show talking about AI just two days ago. Oh, it was, it was, it was actually Mark Graney who's written for Tom Clancy novels and he writes novels for the gray man novels, but he went and saw military drills that were run with AI planes where an AI is in control of the plane and there's no human being behind that plane. And th these were run in a test facility there. They don't have them out running around yet, but it was in a, it was a simulator and the, 
attack mode of the AI plane, not having to think about, geez, I have a wife and kids home. Should I eject? Do I want to preserve my life here? Or do I want to win this dog fight? They found that the aggression level of the AI far exceeded far and beyond humans aggression level like it had no and it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't need to worry about g-force when it turns a plane and they found that the aggressive level against some of the best pilots that the the whoever this was the air force or whatever put up against it they were beating them like 100 percent to one in dog fights because the the ai had didn't have to worry about itself, didn't have to worry about his family, and kids at home, didn't have to worry about preserving a life, didn't have to, you know, take that extra second. Yeah, didn't didn't have to take that extra yeah. secret, didn't have to hold its breath to, you know, contain the G-forces so the blood doesn't go their, their body and stuff and pass out. And it literally was just aggression, 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 aggression. And and dominance. And 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 they just looked at it and they just went, Holy, holy crap. It just changes the face of war and everything if you think about it. Well, and there's a good to that, and there's a there's a difficulty part to that too, right? Yeah. So as long as we're fighting for the right thing, it's a great weapon to wield. And then the question then becomes, you know, how do we decide what that is? But huh. those are great moments where we we can lose less of our our humans, you know, in scenarios where there's there's already such great loss in such situations. So that mm-hmm. that can be beneficial. Definitely. Um, and then, of course, we have people on the other side, China, Russia, that yeah. are pursuing the same sort of thing. And, and you know, while we, while we may not be tying them to NORAD or to missile systems, you know, who knows what these idiots will do, right? <laughs> the question, then, you know, it's like any computer, though, like any video game. Yeah. I know, I, it, it's like that, not to make it, not to simplify it, but if I'm playing... If I'm the person who's playing the video game and I'm I'm the one that's controlling it and I'm the good guy, I think I'm the good guy. I get to I get to do the right thing. Yeah, I'm and trying to do the moral good. high ground. Exactly. You know, exactly. and the other person is just like, yeah, now we'll win at any cost. And so it was kind of extraordinary to me to think about you know all these different things. You mentioned something about ethics and you know rules and regulations, and you know we we call out, maybe have to get on the same page. Maybe we need to have some sort of UN or. Or something of AI, but uh, yeah, it's just it's such a wild west right now, and everything else. What are some things that you uh, want to talk about that we haven't touched on? Ah, you know, one of the things that's been on my mind, I think, is you know, how does when we, on the on the event of on the topics of AI, you know, how do how do we see the, the the best use cases out there? That's a really big, you know, common question, and it's always covered by. We need to create efficiency in some organizations, or we need to do things faster. We need to do things, you know, quicker. Everything from like writing essays or writing books to whatever it might be. And I, I wonder if there's. You know, I don't know what your thoughts here are, Chris, but I wonder if there's a way to think about it much more around what are the things that were we really didn't like to do as human beings, anyways. Mm-hmm. And then you know, and it's not writing books. I think a lot of people actually really like to write books. But one of the things that we didn't like to do. That, and, and how do we use AI to start to resolve some of those very quickly? So something that, that's more meaningful, like, for example, we, we know climate change is a really tough one. Mm-hmm. There's not enough effort being put in it. Probably will never be enough effort being put in it. How does AI start to become our arms and legs and our sort of brain power in that space, which there's not, not enough of us doing stuff about mm-hmm. it? So, you know, is there a mechanism where we can start to encourage or motivate organizations to start to lean on AI for the things that, people will, they don't make it the extra time for, they don't work on the weekends for. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I'm really thinking about. You know, risk is a lot of, when I think about the risk space, a lot of that comes up. There's a lot of things that are are associated with risk that we don't have time to think about because we're busy Mm -hmm. doing other things. Cyber risk, for example. I just had a colleague that uh, got hacked by his iPhone and all the the bank stuff was taken and, and, you know, the wow. accounts were frozen. So the I and so now I'm worrying, you know, wondering how does that happen and how do we create how do we use AI to sort of mitigate these things? Like do we do we create fake simulations that mm-hmm. are just gonna evolve faster and faster and they're gonna be fake. So they're gonna allow us to be smarter about how do we really you know recover from a, a, a fraudulent activity like that. Things like mm-hmm. that. I think I wish we would spend energy on those topics. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Hopefully somebody's working on it. It seems like everyone's Got an AI. Of, oh, my, 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 my dog's got an AI startup at this point. You know, 
And you, you, you touched on something about industry and, and climate change. You've done some advising, I believe, to the insurance industry and their loss and underwriting. You know, we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see crazy stuff in the environment that it's really hard to, I think, at this point, argue. I guess there's some people that are going to still be Star Wars about about uh, climate change. But, you know, I mean, some of the crazy stuff we just saw in this recent month in California, you know, yeah. hurricanes landing and tornado, you know, and just weird, you know, these the floods in California. And you're just like, wow, okay. You know, it's really, it's really starting to become hard to deny this stuff. But, you know, then again, AI may just be like, hey, I know how to fix climate change. Get rid of all these damn humans that are polluting the place. <laughs> no. Well, we're, we're, I think we're the authors of this AI for now. For now. Um, until, until that book comes to life. You know, one of the things I tell insurance organizations, but of, oftentimes any financial services organization that, mm. that, you know, didn't grow up digitally, digitally aware, I guess. I, I don't know if this will make sense to you, Chris, but let, let me let me take a crack at it and you tell me if it's too, too verbose. I, I'm a mathematician, so oftentimes I think of X, Y axes, right? On the X axis is like the reason why companies exist. Their why I, they build products, they do services, all their whys. And on the right, on the leftmost side is like their version of their why. I'm very good at this, so I build these things. And mm -hmm. on the the right hand side of that x axis is the customer's version of of their why. Actually, I need you to build this thing, you know. And they're they're kind of like on the end. Mm -hmm. And then you have this world where in a digital company, there's a y axis that's been introduced, and that y axis is around, you know, not not the why, but the when or the how. You know, when do I meet? When do I interact with a company? How often do I interact with a company? And so if I'm a digitally enabled company, I'm living at the top of the y-axis and I'm 24-7 aware. I'm, I'm bi-directionally interacting with my customer. I'm actually like doing what you're doing. We're, we're talking, mm -hmm. we're, we're in, interacting. And, and that AI is going to be so useful for that because mm -hmm. no human being is there 24-7, but the AI can be. And yeah. on the very bottom, these are the companies that are, you know, I renew I, I new, renew my insurance or it's auto renewed or whatever it might be, but it's once a year. It's very infrequent. In fact, I don't even know what I'm renewing half the time. It's just a policy, right? It's just auto renews. And, I, and if I have a claim, then I go look into it. So it's very yeah. you know, transactional. And we want these, these financial services companies broadly to be on that upper right quadrant. We want them to be bi-directional 24 seven around when we need them. You know, they know more about us enough to help us better, not to be in a creepy way, but to be more you know, responsive to our needs, our changes in our lifestyle and so on. And we want them to know what we want them to build. Don't just buy, you know, build it and then make us buy it. You know, tell us, let us tell you what we want. And that, that world, sort of that digitally enabled world where it's bi-directional and it's outside in, that's an AI heavy world. Mm -hmm. And I think insurance companies aren't, you know, we're, we're, often, we're often worried on, worried about what we are good at and the frequency is very transactional. So we have a we have a ways to go to become a digital company. I think by the way of engagement, you know, the engagement model, yeah. not because we have an online presence. That's a whole yeah. other thing. There you go. I know that the insurance companies are struggling, and they've been pulling out of places like Florida and California. Evidently, California is the one they're pulling back on now too. No. And I, I don't see you know some of the crazy flooding and stuff helping. Do you think AI yeah, can? can help the business normalize and maybe get back on track to where it's good. For oh, I everybody. think, I think it's going to be so, so helpful. Chris, mm -hmm. a simple yeah. example, you know, so a lot of companies that I've worked for and worked with, they, they have lots of wording. So if, if I have a hurricane that hits, I have to know the hurricane wind name for me to know if I insured that. So I'm going to look, I'm looking it up, you know, like, well, does that, is that house have that wind name or did I cover that thing? And, Imagine Gen AI going right at it. It would yeah. just pull all the stuff together. It would all the data. Yeah, it would be super. I mean, talk about those manual activities becoming much more, you know, analytically ready. Yeah. We could do that. We could do that. Yeah. We could do that now. We could It'd be do that great now. if it could solve cancer for us. That'd be awesome. Maybe it will someday. Who knows? Who knows? It, it can could... get us trends much quicker. Yeah, it could. It could put all the stuff together. I think at one point there was supposed to be a billion dollar database of for cancer that was announced in the presidential commission but who knows where that is but trying to get all those thoughts in one place but you know ai could probably pull them from all the different straws that are out there and maybe compile something of course maybe it might just come up with i know the way to cure cure cancer just kill all the humans 
No. There you go. Wipe out all the disease. Sorry, I've watched Terminator too many times, but I, <laughs> there's still hope. Hope springs eternal because it's probably all I got left now. And, and final thoughts as we go out. Anything you want to discuss or pitch out to people on how they can work with you, outreach to you, et cetera, et cetera. It would be really great if there are like-minded individuals that are trying to that are in their in their stage of their giving back model. You know, they've mm-hmm. they've done a lot in the organization, they've done a lot in in their career, and are are looking to see how they can socially add value to communities. I would love to to meet more folks in that space. I'm oftentimes meeting folks that either are looking to create that economic value, which is, you know, that's very, very important. I know we're all in a business, but it's very important for me to also figure out that network of individuals that are trying to look, maybe look at AI, look at data, look at technology, look at analytics, and go one step ahead, go one step beyond to start to educate others and fill some of the gap where AI could really add value. I think there's, we got to make money. Everybody wants that. (laughs) (laughs) Got to pay the bill. (laughs) Yes. And, but we also have to find the right use cases. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I met a woman that is uh, using AI to uh, create mushrooms that eat trash so that we can reduce our footprint of, of, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's something I would have never thought of, but something great to look into. So things like that. I would love to meet people like that. And then AI won't wipe us out because we're making so much trash. They're like, well, they're, they're figuring out their problem through the help of me. So we'll keep them around for, I don't know. That's right. We're still the creator. I keep reminding us. <laughs> <laughs> Not kind of one. There's still time. So there you go. So how can people reach out to you uh, for speaking engagements, uh, board things, advice, sure. consulting, et cetera, et cetera? I think my website's probably the best one. So H-E-N-N-A, the two N's right there, and then K-A-R-N as in Nancy A. I know people say karma, but it's actually just karna. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but that's the website. And I think there's a way to link, link to me from that site and I'll get the email or any questions you have or any advice you have. There you go. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Hannah. It's been a great discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. There you go. And thanks to, uh, thanks to Arns for tuning in and AI for letting us uh, do this podcast. Uh, thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Please. Thanks the community. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for our AI lower or alerts for letting this happen. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss one on the TikTokity, and Chris Foss Facebook.com. Be good to each other, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.